to create maps, um, we use both ArcGIS and QGIS depending on the need. We're a bit of a tool agnostic organization, meaning we really choose the tool that best meets our partners' needs. So for the actual map creation done by our team, we use mostly ArcGIS and we have a whole system, uh, the whole geodatabase is uh, set up accordingly. However, uh, in all contexts where we're trying to transfer skills and capacities to local actors, be it our our partner NGOs or else other stakeholders in the field, we usually favor QGIS as it's a free and open source tool um, to make sure that people can actually use it without having any licenses problems uh, on a day to day basis. So the data collection is a bit more tricky because um, there are very different types of data collections that can occur on the geographic side. If we're doing uh, infrastructure data collection, so for example, being able to collect all of the information on different shelters or uh, latrines or water points in a given context, we're going to need a very structured approach, which uh, we usually use um, ArcGIS for, so collector for ArcGIS. However, 90% of our data collections are either on less structured data, geographical data, where you might use tools like um, OSMAND to, to collect uh, traces or uh, just take a geotagged photo or else survey types mobile data collections where we usually use free and open source tools like Open Data Kit uh, where we can easily collect a GPS point and take um, ask a few questions uh, to a beneficiary or else uh, do a, an evaluation of the quantity of water at a water point etc etc. So we use different sources of data. So there's both the primary data that we collect directly from the field or that our partners collect directly in the field because we very rarely do the data collection ourselves. It's usually more training others to do the data collection. And then there's all the secondary data that's available through the partner or other partners. Um, there are a lot of different sources of data. So it's always important to also triangulate the different sources of data to ensure the reliability of the data and how up to date it is. So it's a combination of different approaches. So drones is a subject that's usually talked of a lot in the sector and it's the same in the private sector, it's not just in the humanitarian sector. But those who actually use it are much uh, less numerous. So we actually did a study on that in 2016 uh, with an organization called FSD, the, the Swiss uh, Demining uh, Foundation, on the use of drones in the humanitarian sector, trying to evaluate the, the return on investment that drone brings. And a lot of the conclusions were a little bit depressing that uh, there aren't that many projects where it's really relevant, um, mostly due to the constraints in the usage of drones, uh, both in terms of legal implications. There are a lot of countries where you can fly a drone, like in France, for example, you can't fly a drone just like that. And also in terms of skills, knowing how to treat the data, process the data that's been collected, requires uh, some skills. So there, there are different contexts where it is very relevant. I mean, we've seen very interesting experiences in uh, disaster risk reduction projects or in post-catastrophe, natural catastrophe environments where you can use drones to easily collect imagery after the catastrophe to be able to evaluate how intense um, the disaster was and the damages were to a given area. But it's true that um, the study showed that there wasn't quite as much usage as uh, it was generally thought when you hear all about uh, the, all the, the media articles about the use of drones. Um, 
In fact, it's still a lot of pilots uh, that aren't always brought to fruition. So the data uh, is shared in different ways. First of all, there's data that can be very sensitive and therefore is not shared very widely. Um, in the humanitarian sector, one of the basic principles is the do no harm approach, making sure that whatever we do does not have any dire consequences for our beneficiaries. And therefore, uh, the use of data is something that we're very careful about to avoid that data being used in ways that uh, beneficiaries would not agree with. So anything related to personal information and sensitive information is usually not shared uh, very widely except for very specific uh, needs. Also, we deal with a lot of data such, such as the location of armed groups, um, which is extremely sensitive. So these obviously are, are not shared uh, widely. Then we have the second level of information that uh, is shared, but internally to an organization uh, because it's, um, you know, it can't be widely disseminated for various uh, reasons, uh, but it does need to be shared with all of the stakeholders of a given organization. So that will usually be through intranets or internal portals or like the map portal we manage for Doctors Without Borders, where there are a few thousand maps that's been created over the past few years. And then what we try and promote uh, as much as possible is the wider dissemination. And this is done through uh, websites such as Humanitarian Data Exchange, HDX, which is a platform for sharing data sets in the sector. Also Relief Web, where usually it's maps that are produced that are shared for the sector and also platforms like OpenStreetMap to share base map type uh, information as widely as possible. So sometimes we create data for a humanitarian uh, partner in his own databases, but we're always going to try and encourage him to also share it through OpenStreetMap or, or other platforms as much as is possible. So trainings in general is a large part of our activity. Our main aim is the capacity building of other actors. So we do a lot of trainings both in headquarters of organizations and in the field. The question of training on GIS is a bit specific because um, as you might know, it requires uh, quite intense trainings. I mean, I myself did uh, the two years of uh, GIS um, uh, during my, my studies. And therefore, it's not as easy and rapid and efficient to train someone up in GIS as it is, for example, on another subject that we deal with, mobile data collection, where in a few days you can really master the whole process and implement it without it being an issue. So in terms of GIS, uh, we do give maybe four or five trainings every year in the field, uh, usually five day sessions on QGIS, for example. But what we do more of is awareness raising sessions in headquarters of organizations where we, we show um, what are the stakes around data and geographic information how uh, you need to formalize your need when you want to make a map request, sort of organ organizing your data in such a way to make map production possible. So there, there are three other organizations working on the same topics as us in the sector. The first one is a British uh, NGO uh, funded by DFID, uh, the, the British funder, who is specialised in map production, in particular after emergencies or in big crises. So they're actually composed mostly of volunteers who are deployed for a couple of weeks after the emergency to help create maps for the, for the sector. So we sometimes partner with them on, on different projects. Then there's an American NGO called IMAP that we've also partnered with in, in the past, done research projects together. 
um, who are particularly implanted in, in the Middle East, um, but also elsewhere, and who run big projects in terms of mobile data collection and information management. And then there's another entity called uh, REACH, uh, part of the IMPACT initiative, uh, who mostly supports uh, clusters. So clusters are set up uh, usually with a specific thematic around a given crisis to help organizations coordinate and be more efficient uh, in their response. So our specificity compared to the other organizations uh, would be, first of all, that we don't only work in the humanitarian sector, we also work a little bit in the development sector. And beyond that, um, we probably do proportionally more capacity building and knowledge building. Um, so really the idea of transfer of skills as much as uh, possible than the other organizations. But uh, yeah, we're very complementary and we usually coordinate quite a bit uh, just to make sure that uh, we all stay as efficient as possible for the sector. So my main advice would be to get to know the sector in different ways through events or, or going to a mapathon just to understand the type of needs uh, that humanitarian organizations might have. Um, it's a very specialized sector. Uh, it's not like 30 years ago when sort of anybody could become a humanitarian now. There are like very specific skill sets. And GIS is definitely a skill set that is searched for in the sector, but uh, organizations rarely can, can rarely actually afford having GIS specialists in-house. So it's only very large organizations that really have in headquarters specialized units. I'm thinking of the ICRC, the International uh, Red Cross Committee that uh, have a big team or Doctors Without Borders or big UN organizations. But most medium-sized NGOs would love to have GIS teams, but um, their funding models don't always make it possible. So they would often have staff in the field related to a specific project to help uh, create maps, uh, but they, they don't have like um, very structured uh, support. So it's important to keep in mind for somebody who wants to do GIS, um, you know, a lot of the positions in the field are more national staff type positions than uh, people sent uh, from afar, except for those, uh, those big organizations. And so inside Cartoon-G, we don't have a specialized thematic. So we work with refugees on the migrant situation, uh, we work on nutrition, food security, health, uh, water and sanitation, environment, disaster risk reduction. And GIS works with all of those themes. There's, there's so much to be done on these subjects. Uh, however, a student who wants to actually apply GIS to the humanitarian sector will usually be expected to have a have experience, uh, professional experience before working uh, in the sector. So I, for example, worked for five years in the private sector before uh, joining the humanitarian sector as a professional. I mean, I was working as a volunteer before and it helped me get to know the, the sector much better. Uh, but it's true that yeah, try and get to know the sector and keep in mind that it's important uh, to actually be useful in the sector to have a certain expertise beyond just uh, GIS. A lot of the positions um, available in the sector will have a line on uh, GIS because everybody wants a GIS specialist, but having real specialized positions that do only that are not that frequent or very much uh, sought after.